Monday, Monday, we are back, Anthony Melcari. We haven't talked all weekend. I, I got to tell you, it was weird because I meant to call you a couple of times, but I was so freaking tired that I didn't call you, and now I feel all guilty about it. <laughs> I still love you. All right, thank you. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, hey, everybody. Glenn Housman here with the one and the only incredible Anthony McCurry. Thank you for joining us on No Vacancy Live. I'm excited, Anthony. It was a good weekend. I really had a chance to uh, refresh myself uh, a, a little bit. So that was good. But I honestly, I picked up the phone to call you a couple of times. I don't know why I didn't. No, me too. I was thinking about yesterday. I got to call him. But yeah. Really, it was like when I see our when I see our intro, it reminds me, because a lot of shots are done in Vegas, it reminds me that we need to set up to go to Vegas. So when are we doing that? All right, so I did over the weekend drop a couple of notes to some people over there because I do think we want to get there before the, the incredible resorts world opening later this summer. I feel like we got to get to Virgin. I feel like we got to get to um, Circa, a couple of the other properties that are down there. And I also reached out to my friends over at Caesars because we haven't featured them yet on this show. How well, let's go. And this is what happens when we all talk on the weekends. We do our business live. I know, but that's good because this gives people a peek behind the scenes and it saves us time and we don't have to come up with as much content. That's right. so it's not so, like a real win -win so, for everybody but the audience. Anthony. So we have one of my favorite people in the industry and just a legend. Um, so I'm looking forward to our conversation today. All right, we're going to bring him on one second. But I did want to say first congratulations to our friend Gary Cardona, who's been a big supporter of ours throughout this past year, watching the show, participating in the show. He just opened up G Hospitality Furnishings, a 220,000 square foot factory where they're making furniture here in the United States. So I did want to congratulate him on that. You can find him at ghospitalityfurnishings.com. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate it. If you just reach out to him, not getting paid for it, but he's a super good guy and I want to send him a little love. Yeah, and send me a DM um, so I can get back to you because um, we were, were making a conscious effort to buy everything in North America. Ah, yes. We had talked about that. That'll be awesome. Speaking about buying things in North America, let me just quickly thank the good folks over at uh, Ecotech. Uh oh Sorry, I went to go grab this garbage can and there was a cat hanging out inside of it. So that was a little bit of a challenge. Listen, the, these guys are great. They're on Amazon.com right now, but you really want to buy direct. And we're going to get you an extra 10% off by going to uh, them right now. You can find them at eco-techwaste.com. Save you a ton of money on labor. You don't have to worry about emptying those trash cans, right, Anthony? No. And also we have a new product placement at Petco that we're going to, you know, the... the um it's where the pet goes, the Echo T waste basket. Yeah, splotchy splotch was in the there. Echo Tech waste basket, where the cats go. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. I love that. All right. Forget all the ads. Forget all that kind of stuff. I'm excited because we've got the incredible Mr. Bill Walsh returning to us as the CEO of Visory Hotels. Bill, so great to see you, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for having me back on. It's always a pleasure. Bill, I'm excited today to have you on because last time we talked to you, we were in the depths of depression yeah. and sadness. I'm feeling things are a little bit different. It kind of reminds me of the great vibes I'm getting from your property over here in St. Lucia. Beautiful, bright, sunny, positivity looking forward. How are you feeling today, Bill? Yeah, look, I, I think even back when we last spoke in, in the depths of pandemic, we at Viceroy were remaining optimistic. We were remaining positive. We, we were identifying and celebrating some pandemic positives that, that occurred. And if you recall, um, we talked about staying focused in, in that period by controlling what we could control and, and by simply reacting to what we could not control. Uh, and until I realized that that was the approach to take, yeah, it was, it was a pretty... Um, pretty desperate time. Um, but we, we remain positive, we remained optimistic, we remain connected as a team of people. Uh, and speaking to peers in industry, I think it's a common trait. I think what we're seeing is that many teams who have been on this journey together have come out or are coming out the other end stronger than we entered. It, it's kind of weird. We've yeah. never been so geographically and, and, and physically separated as a team of people. Yet we have never been closer as a team of people than we are now. And but I will say, Bill, we're, we're seeing positives happening. 
You've never been cooler because if you look behind you, you've got that No Vacancy Live logo over there in the background. Thanks for putting that up. I appreciate there you go. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, it's all about the brand. You guys know me for a long time. It's brand, brand, brand. Um, oh, I didn't even see that. Thank you. <laughs> But we, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're feeling good. And, and there's nothing that makes a hotelier feel better than, than ringing telephones um, or any other digital version of that. And the phones are ringing. Um, my new favorite word ever is the word vaccination. And we're seeing people take a vaccination now. Everybody, and it's not only as soon as they get the jab with the needle that people are booking travel. As soon as they have an appointment for a vaccination, people are going online, they're booking travel, they're giving themselves something to look forward to, something that they haven't been able to do for uh, such a long time. So forward reservations, particularly in resort destinations, um, are looking phenomenal, um, quite frankly. So phones are ringing, cash registers will follow them very soon. So smile on face. Vaccination. <laughs> Vaccination. 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 I, I haven't heard that before. Have you, Glenn? No, I, I haven't. But now that he said it, I bet you we're going to start to hear it absolutely everywhere. It's one of those things about human nature. As soon as, some, as, soon as something comes into your consciousness, right. all of a sudden you tend to hear so, it. So, Bill, one of the questions that are on my mind and, and on everybody's mind, and, and it just seems to be the hottest topic in our industry, and really a lot of industries right now, is employment. Finding employees. What, what, what's happening with Viceroy? Well, I think if, if we go back to a year ago, um, you know, one of the, mo the most difficult things about the pandemic impact was the immediacy, the brutality of the disruption to continuity of employment that our colleagues in the industry faced. I mean, people were employed on a Monday, they were furloughed on a Friday, and they were they were let go the following week. And it, it's, it's been terrifying for so many people. We, at that time, immediately set up a program uh, where we call we called it pole position and we wanted as a brand to be in pole position that racing term to be on the grid at formula one to be in pole position to to get back out there as soon as circumstances allowed and re-employ as many people as we could now a year ago we were planning pole position to kick in at the end of may june in the latest july of 2020 and, and clearly things went on for a lot longer than expected people got paid stimulus checks uh, people decided maybe that hospitality was not for them, sought out and, and in many cases found new opportunities. So fast forward to where we are today and to the, to the purpose of your question, it's really difficult. Um, it, it's hard to, to find great talent um, who, who want to come and work in the industry. It's, fine. it's hard to find people who want to come back because many have made alternative uh, career choices during the past year. But there are Again, pockets of positivity. Um, you know, recently uh, we were ramping back up one of our San Francisco hotels, Hotel Emblem. We went out um, to ask 12 former colleagues to return to the hotel, and 11 of them said yes wow. on that day, and, and were back with us a week later. And they're the kind of things that make us super happy. Um, but th there's a fight for, for talent out there. And I think one of the other reasons that hotels are impacted, guys, is that um, hotels and resorts in seasonal destinations frequently use international students coming in on J-1 visas mm -hmm. as supplementary workforce. And because of the COVID situation, they have not been able to travel. They've not been able to come into the country. And that, that has created a very um, significant burden um, on, on many resorts that have actually stayed busy. If I think of the Viceroy in Snowmass, it, it's actually, it, it's been extremely busy. Um, all of the way through, I think people feel more confident in open air surroundings. They feel more comfortable being up in a mountain. Uh, and kudos to general manager Robert Purdy and the entire team. I mean, you have breakfast at Viceroy Snowmass. Your orange juice is brought by the GM. Your toast is brought by the financial controller. And, and you're meeting probably every member of the executive team in between. So it's a case of all hands on deck um, and teams coming together. Yeah, and it's... Um and it's it's throughout the industry. You know, if you can put up that graphic you guys just had up, uh, Glenn. Yeah, yeah, I'll bring, um, it, I'll bring that right back up. Give me one. Yeah, and, you know, Bill, the hospitality family um, uh, Facebook group this morning. Yeah, it says we are short staffed. If, for those people listening to it, we are. It said, there's a note, and it was placed, I believe, on the bed or the desk, and said, "We are short staffed. Please be patient with the staff that did show up. No one wants to work anymore." Now, there's a couple of problems with that. One, I understand their stress. I understand their frustration. If I worked on that team, I'm going to tell you that's not a great team to work on because yeah. you're talking to your guest 
like you're giving your guest your problem. You can do that in a much more classic, uh, classy way, a little bit more, you know, even, you know, I can't say five star, but even three star way. You don't have to make the guest your problem, the guest problem. Bill, what do you think of a note like that on the bed? I mean, I, I think you're being polite and, and I will be equally polite in, in terms of the, the vocabulary that I use. Um, and uh, compared to if it was us talking about that note over a beer, I'd, I'd describe it in a very different way. Um, but let's let's just say it's offensive, um, and, and I think it's offensive for for the reason that you just stated. You don't share share your problems with the guest. The guest is showing up with the expectation that you have the wherewithal to figure out and overcome whatever problems you have. I just think it's offensive to to say that people don't want to work anymore uh, just because this particular hotel or restaurant or or whatever it was. Um, can't find people to come back. Maybe it's the culture that 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 exists there that well, people that don't want to come lot. back that, to. That but also, me a lot. I, I think you know to to assume and to state that people just don't want to work anymore because that particular place can't recruit. When you think of the circumstances that hospitality colleagues, particularly those on the front line, uh, who 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 don't make a lot of money, found themselves in, if one of those colleagues or many of those colleagues chose during pandemic to say, I'm not going to rely on hospitality anymore. I'm going to go and work for Amazon. I'm going to go and be an Uber Eats driver. I'm going to do something else because I have to feed my children. I have to keep a, a roof over my head. Um, then huge respect to those individuals for having the courage to go out and make whatever hard decision they needed to make and to do what they needed to, to do. Um, and if you have a, a hospitality location, which obviously has a lousy culture that people probably wouldn't want to come back and work in anyway, um, having difficulty recruiting after those circumstances, just simply saying, they don't want to work anymore, um, you know, th th then they're in the wrong business. And I, and I think, listen, before the pandemic with Amazon and with Uber Eats and Uber, you were already seeing, you know, people leave the industry to be there own boss to be an entrepreneur yeah and, and also in, in in amazon there are the benefits are getting better the wages i think they started at 20 dollars an hour so you're you're really competing with that even before the pandemic it's about culture you said it i mean i hate the word because it's overused but you know, because a lot of people say culture and they have a bad culture i have one person in mind during the pandemic was spouting things, but wasn't running his own hotels. And so culture is is a great word, but it's overused. You have to really live it every day. Well, I think you do. And I, and I think we, we've talked before about the importance of having an ideology in a business and having that, that purpose of being able to articulate not just how you do what you do, but to be able to articulate why uh, you do it and to work towards that purpose. And, and Anthony, I think one of the other things that businesses are going to see now is they're trying to attract people to come back uh, as they're gearing back up is they're going to live with the repercussions of how they treated those people on their way out a year ago and there are too many stories in our industry of people that were furloughed and then subsequently laid off without explanation without the courtesy of a conversation from one human being to another of people that were laid off by email and and who who you know they weren't treated with respect on the way out and now those businesses are saying to the same folks, hey, by the way, now I need you again. Now I'm going to communicate with you. You haven't heard from me for a year. I don't know. I wonder how many of these hoteliers that are finding it difficult to re-recruit people actually kept in contact with those people that were furloughed and laid off from their businesses over the past year. How many of them went out and said, how are you doing? I had a family how are you member. Feeling? I had a family member literally deal with that issue. And if the person would have kept in contact with this person, uh, the person would have held on a little bit longer. And now that they're recruiting, um, this person's gone on to other things. And it's disappointing. Yeah. Um, and again, culture, culture, culture. I, I think that, um, you know, you, you, you reap what you sow. And I think if people did not feel appreciated, did not feel respected, were not treated as human beings when the pandemic hit, right. if the phone rings from the people who treated them in that matter saying, hey, by the way, now come back. Of course, they're going to think twice about doing that. Yeah, well, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. So what is the situation then that your company is in when it comes to rehiring? And how do you think all of these external pressures that are happening out there with things beyond your control will affect how much uh, employees are going to make in the future? Um, I, I think that for those employees that are coming back to work, particularly again, and I think what we're seeing is, is two hospitality industries emerging. You're seeing resort destinations that have 
um, some clear momentum and, uh, and the recovery in those resort destinations is going to be a lot faster and more immediate than in some urban destinations, particularly urban destinations that are reliant upon um, compression generated from large group movements. So if you have uh, citywide conventions as being a large driver of business for hotels and locations, it's going to take longer for those to come back. But where you're seeing business return, what we're seeing is guests that are absolutely delighted to be able to travel again, those, those vaccination folks that we talked about earlier. And they're happy when they show up. They're treating themselves well. I think we're seeing a lot more spontaneity in, in people's spend. You know, hoteliers, now is the time at check-in to say to somebody, by the way, we have a suite available, you know, for X dollars, you can upgrade yourself. Would you like the champagne and flour and strawberries package? Whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And people are like, yeah, it's been so long since we've been able to travel. We want to feel good uh, and, and we want to be happy. Uh, and they're spending more. And I think and hope that that is also going to have positive uh, impact for colleagues in that gratuities will be higher. Um, and, and, you know, I just think we're the place that people will be happy to be. And it should really be a joy fest because we have colleagues who are delighted to be back at work. We have guests who are delighted to be back being served by those colleagues. Um, and, and, you know, it ticks every box. Yeah, and I think you're right. And I think there is an excitement. I went out to dinner to a new place in my neighborhood. Uh, it's a little French bistro in the water, and um, there was an 18% uh, service charge, and it said, do the higher wages, whatever. We, we, we're putting this 18% on. However, you don't need to tip the waitress or waiter and uh, any extra if you don't deem necessary, whatever it was, the verbiage. And um, my wife said, okay, we don't have to tip her. And I said, no, no, we're going to tip her too. And then when she came over to the table, after I tipped her, after the bill was closed out and I gave her back to her, I said, okay, now that it's closed out and I already gave you a tip on top of the 18%, I want to ask, because I wanted to think her answer was based on a tip. So I said, do you get most of that 18%? And she said, we all share it, but yes, I get a proper percentage that goes directly to me. But there are you know workers in the, in the kitchen and that it goes to, but also, I get my share. I said, and do you feel that that's an appropriate share? And she goes, yes. And I said, okay. And I, and I had tipped her anyway. But I was just curious because I want to make sure that that was going to – and I think right. there's going to be more and more of that um, as time goes on as, as you're starting to get wage pressure. Yeah, and, and look, maybe for, for the folks listening, I would say don't think of it uh, as a tip for those frontline uh, food and beverage service colleagues – Think of it more as a courage contribution, because these are the people, young people, most of whom um, have not achieved eligibility for vaccination yet, and certainly for the vast majority of the time through pandemic, they remained on the front line, whether it was for outdoor dining, whether it was packing the bags that were handed to you for, for takeaway, whether it was food delivery. Um, and, and they were on the, on the front line of, of the hospitality industry, unvaccinated, uh, putting themselves and their families at risk so that we could have our pizza or we could have our beef or you know, whatever it was that we were getting. Um, so the very least we can do is to recognize and, and pay respect to those individuals for the courage that they showed through a financial contribution that says thank you. Yeah, you know what? That is a beautiful way of putting it. I would have never been able to put it that that, that well. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think when you, when you look at certain groups of people, for example, we at, at Viceroy have just reintroduced a program that we're very proud of called Contribution Without Compromise. And it allows our guests to contribute a thank you without compromising anything. Because every time a guest shows up at a Viceroy hotel, just by the act of checking in to their room, they trigger the release and availability of another room at a 50% discount for a healthcare hero. So they're making a contribution with no compromise just by being there. And that's our way of saying thank you. And we're saying thank you to, again, those, those heroic healthcare folks who stayed on the front line to keep us safe while the vast majority of us worked from home. And, and it, you know, it, it made me think of a phrase, Anthony, that um, I, I know you'll agree with, with, with this idea um, that we use for, for military very correctly. And we say thank you for your service when we encounter somebody from the military. And so we should on every occasion. I don't think it just applies to the military. I think if we meet a healthcare worker who has been on the front line of pandemic, and I would argue that many of our hospitality colleagues who remained on the front line through pandemic, the least we can say to them is thank you for your service. Uh, and we should express that in the most meaningful way possible.
I like that. I like that attitude. But before we wrap up the the employment part of it, um, I think it's important to talk about these J one visas that were um uh, discontinued for a, a, a while, and they allow people to come to the United States and work as seasonal workers. I believe yeah. that that's the one, right? Yeah, correct. Um, what is the status of that, as far as you know? And do you think you're going to be able to leverage that to help fill the employment gap? as a valuable tool that you've always used as a hotel company in the past. And I should say most resorts, seasonal resorts in particular, depend on this type of visa in order to be able to ramp up their employment hiring. Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm not talking with absolute factual knowledge here. So I'm speculating yeah, from conversations that we've had internally is, it, um, Glenn, it depends very much on the um, place of origin of that of that J1. A lot of those J1 colleagues um, typically come from Europe. I'm an Irishman. I mean, this is the way that many, many uh, generations of Irish folks have seen the world um, over over the past number of decades by getting a J1 visa to, to come to the United States and to work for a summer in a hotel, in a resort, in a yacht club, wherever it might be. Um, as we know, Europe is still suffering quite significantly as a result of coronavirus impact, their vaccination program does not seem to be as advanced uh, as we have here in the United States. So I think it's going to be a challenge. I think um, the willingness for people to travel, their ability to travel, um, and um, the availability of J-1 visas is going to be something that will not be as easy to work with as perhaps it has been historically. Now, my, uh, my understanding is that when it comes to uh, what was going on in Europe is they they did not allow individual member countries in the European Union to negotiate on their own. That kind of put them behind a little bit. So they're a little bit farther behind where we are here in the United States because of that. So hopefully they'll get caught up uh, soon enough. But um, uh, Bill, that it's so that it's so interesting though that because they're far behind, even if we had these va the program in place, it still might be worthless because unless people are vaccinated, they're not going to be over here anyway. Correct. And I think whether it's J1 uh, visa holders coming into work, if, if it's the confidence that guests have to travel post vaccination, it's the key to everything for me. You know, uh, like you guys growing up in this industry, people used to say to us the, the, the key factor for success in, in the hotel business, the three factors are location, location and location. I think that changed in recent years. And I've, I've said in, in those times that the three factors for success of any hotel are activation, activation, and activation, meaning thoughtful programming, helping guests create memories that last for a lifetime. I am in no doubt that as we sit here having this conversation today, the three factors that are critical for success for our industry are vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. And I don't mean that to be a political statement. Right. I, I, I respect people's right to choose, mm -hmm. but I think that those who choose not to get vaccinated if you're working in hospitality um, is going to impede the ability for our business to come back and to to do what we're here to do, which is to create continuity of employment for as many people in the hospitality industry as we possibly can do. So my request, and look, I'm, I'm I guess I'm I'm fortunate that I'm old enough that I've had my both of my shots. Um, we have a program in in Viceroy where we're incentivizing our colleagues across the company <clears throat> to get vaccinated, and we're giving bonus PTO hours for anybody who. Who does go out and get vaccinated? And we believe that that that's a critical. And are you seeing? Are you seeing a big? Uh, are you seeing a big push? Are you seeing them getting vaccinated? Most of your employees. Yes, we are. We are, and I, I think that it's about making um, information, factual information, available. Uh, it's about <clears throat> saying to folks, "Don't do as I say, but do as I I do." When I when I went for my first shot, I went to a drive-through at Cal State. Uh, here in, in LA, and it was like two hours at five miles an hour snaking through the, the, the grounds of the campus. And suddenly we got there and this um, amazing young National Guardsman came up to the window and he said, uh, you know, left arm or right arm. And I went, what, we're doing it now? And he said, yeah, what's the problem? And I said, I, I haven't got the angles worked out for the selfie. And I wanted to make sure that the logo was in there so that I could that I could share the image with my colleagues and say, this isn't just a message from the CEO. This isn't a memo saying, go get vaccinated. This is me right. saying, I've done it. I believe in it. I feel safe. My family are going to get vaccinated. I believe you and your family should as well. And, and we've had a, a phenomenal response uh, across Viceroy. And I thank each and every colleague that's had the courage to go out and do that. Most importantly, did you get the selfie? 
I did get the selfie, yes, and and um, um, you know, got got the got the, the brand folks were happy because the logo was in in shot and it wasn't blurred. Well, here at No Vacancy Live, uh, both me and my friend uh, are va vaccinated. Glenn is getting his second vaccination. When, Glenn? 28th. 20th. I've really received mine, um, and I've way past the two weeks, and my kids are receiving it Thursday, and my wife's vaccinated. Everybody around us is vaccinated. I had a good friend that I pushed who was doing a film in Florida. He got vaccinated. He wasn't going to get vaccinated. And he said to me, called me up, he goes, I feel so much better. He goes, thank you for, for for convincing me. And I, you know, he goes, I just feel better. I'm not thinking about it. It's not something that I even, I get to set. I don't even think about it. And and that's really what it's about. You know, when I go out now, I don't think about it anymore. I have to yeah. do the walk back to the car all the time for my mask. Yeah. And, and, and I think, um, but I think it's important that, that we don't get complacent in our workplaces and in, in, in hospitality <clears throat> as a result of vaccination. There are still people um, who, who are, seeking the comfort of of recognizing that correct protocols are in place. And, and at Viceroy, um, oh, again, not intending to sound political, but we have to take our lead from somewhere. We take our lead from the CDC. So if CDC say, even in this post-vaccination environment, maintain social distancing in workplaces, wear masks, then we're going to do that. Um, it's really hard otherwise, because it has become very political. And if you listen to the direction given in five different states by five different governors of two different parties for whatever reason that they're they're giving uh, their advice it, it it differs wildly so we're going to adhere to cdc um we're going to to be cautious and i think that as an industry um we need to also keep an eye on um the fact that there are a lot of people out there who have not yet been vaccinated try to make sure that those folks have access to that as soon as possible keep an eye on these these strains um, to, to make sure that we don't find ourselves well, back in a bad place, here, but, but remain positive and optimistic. Here in New York, it's it's really being rolled out. And when they said the kids can get it 18 and over or young yeah. adults, um, I thought it would be a nightmare to get their vaccination. But every kid I know um, that's 18 and over is getting it. And it's great, Anthony. The, 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 the reaction to that is from what I hear in, about New York is that tourism numbers for the summer are looking strong. Um, restaurants have reopened. Um, my brother... Uh, Sinjin, who lives in New York, lives in, um, in in Brooklyn. He was giving out to me over the weekend on the phone about how long it took him to walk around Chelsea because there was too many tourists on the streets. But he was saying that with a smile on his face because it's a great thing uh, for the city. The they went to a ball packed. game. Everything is busy. Every, I, I mean, I'm seeing, you know, res, uh, restaurants packed. With, when I say packed, they're they're full as they could be based on the the uh, limitations. But uh, you starting to see. I'm starting to hear. You know, we were at the pier last week, and they said they're starting to see a lot of leisure. It was very interesting what he said last week, Francois, was that he was he's a business hotel. The pier is very much business hotel, and he really didn't give. Although, of course, they treated leisure very importantly, but they didn't really think about the programming of it, right? Like to use your words, programming, programming, programming. And now for the next two years, he feels that basically his guests are going to be leisure guests and the programming of his hotel is changing. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. And, and look, it has to be because the, the, the danger for us in hospitality is that we we because of pandemic we just focus on those circumstances and we forget what we are here to do and we are here to help our guests create memories that will last them for a lifetime um you know i, I always say at orientation or or when um when speaking publicly as your as your warm-up guy as we talked about last time um you know I, i've been doing this for 30 years the one thing that i have never met and will never meet i've never met a guest who, whose purpose in, in arriving at a hotel was to be bored. They don't right. come to be bored. They come to be entertained and they come for programming, they come for activation. Similarly, we've all put, correctly, put pandemic protocols in place in all of our, in our hotels. You guys saw it firsthand when you did that amazing um, show from Hotel Xena in, in Washington, D.C. And, and the Viceroy in Washington, D.C. And those protocols need to be in place. We need to keep people safe. But equally, guests don't, they don't want to feel like they're checking into a hospital. So our job is to make sure that we have the appropriate protocols in place, those processes that are keeping people safe, but that we don't allow that to distract us from our purpose, which is to deliver hospitality through amazing service that makes people feel special, recognized and respected, 
uh, and where they, they do generate those memories that will last them for a lifetime. And Gina, the best hamburger in- uh, There you go. <laughs> yeah, he really liked that hamburger. I remember producer Dave actually stayed late the next day just to have the hamburger again. I, so, I, I, I think you'll remember my words, Bill, for a long time, because I think they, they people uh, told you what I said when I said, and I won't use the word, but I said, this is the best yes. effing hamburger I've ever had. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and look, I agree, as I said to you um, when we were talking about it afterwards, um, I, I felt the same. And, and because I have the privilege of direct access to chef, um, <laughs> I, I got the recipe and I actually have my local um, butcher, um, Standings Butcher on Melrose Avenue here in Los Angeles recreate the exact blend of that burger and, and I got a pack made once a month. So hey, hey, is. hey, hey. <laughs> Why did you send me any for Christmas? <laughs> Sorry. And Anthony, are you still there? I, I, Glenn, I think we've lost Anthony. I looks at yeah, it looks that way. You know, when you make crazy requests, you know, what what happens to you. But Bill, um I'm curious, you know, we talk often on this. We may have even mentioned this to you before about how is now is a great great reset period, the time to rethink everything that you're doing at the hotel, not to make it more sterile and like a hospital, but to reorient yourself to the way that guests want to experience hotels now. How are you thinking about that? Not in April, but next fall, next winter. Do you think you're going to get back to being uh, normal? How are you planning ahead with future programming of the properties to make sure you're currently on, on health trends while making sure that we could bring back some of the closeness and intimacy we had before COVID Sure. Started? Um, well, well, yes, we are going to, to get to normal, but I'm not going to say get back to normal. We're going to get to normal, but it's going to be a new normal. And I think that that new normal, Glenn, is going to uh, see the continuity of certain practices and processes that have been introduced directly as a result of pandemic and others will, will fall away. I, I can't wait till we have sufficient vaccination, that we have herd immunity, that I can walk into a restaurant, into a hotel. Um, and and see people's smiling faces as opposed to just smiling eyes, which a lot of people have become really good I, at smiling I with their eyes. I really but, work at know, it. I can't I can't wait for for the masks um, to to go away, but there's still a necessity. I think what many of us have done in in the hotel business is to introduce uh, smart technology because of the pandemic, and some of those uh, technologies will remain because actually not only have they been appropriate for pandemic circumstances, but they've improved efficiency and they've made us better. An example, uh, we at, at Viceroy across the portfolio um, have introduced uh, voice automation for, for requests. So we've either put Google Home or we put Amazon Alexa um, into our hotel rooms, which allows the guest to avoid having to physically interact with a phone. Doesn't matter how sanitized it is, people just don't wanna to touch a phone that other people have touched before. They don't wanna pull the drapes across. They don't wanna maybe use the TV remote control. So we have said, let's do that. And then we suddenly realized, wait, all we're doing is playing catch up here to the lives that most of our guests are lead, right. leading at home anyway. And I think, I think from a convenience standpoint, I agree with you a thousand percent, but this is what I don't understand. When we're in a hotel room, people that say, like, don't want to touch the remote, the shades, the this, the that, you, you're you touching everything. You're laying on sheets. You're you're touching doorknobs. You're touching hangers. You're touching a flashometer. You're touching the shower. You're It's like you can't – once you're in a hotel room, what I tell people is choose wisely. Make sure you go online. Make sure you call the hotel. Make sure you choose a really good hotel. Even if you, if, if you can afford to pay a couple dollars, get the hotel of your choice. Then go – and do and do the right thing. You socially distance. You know, sanitize your hands. Wear your mask. But when you close the room and you do your own little inspection and your own little sanitizing, then just enjoy the room. Enjoy your vacation. You know, and and so when I when I've been in now I've been in probably ten hotel more than that in the last couple of months. I've been in a lot of hotel rooms, and I do exactly that. I make sure I choose wisely. I walk in. There was one hotel I was in that I wasn't that feeling very comfortable. Um, I had no choice to stay there. And um, I slept on top of the, um, I put a, a white sh um, sheet and a towel. I slept on top of the bedspread. And um, I took a shower and I left the room and I, I tried not to touch anything, but it's about choosing wisely. And if you choose wisely, you don't really have that much to worry about. It is, but, but to, and, and I agree with you. I think you're also, um, logic sometimes applies to when, when people make decisions, sometimes it, it, it doesn't. But I think, again, some of these, these um, processes that are technology driven that we have introduced because of pandemic should have arguably been 100%. in place anyway. So, 100%. I mean, how many of our guests 
arrive home um, in an evening, open the door, walk in, and say, Alexa, play play music by whatever. And, and that's maybe the first thing they do. So the fact that we had lost pace with the lifestyles of our guests was something that needed to be addressed anyway. So I think showing up at a hotel, um, having contactless check-in, if, yeah. if you so desire, um, is is something that will remain. And I think having those those technologies will will also remain. I think one of the other things that people are going to want to see going forward is evidence that where they are um, is is being kept clean. And you know, we as hoteliers, we love doing a lot of that work behind the scenes uh, with, with limited visibility. Um, whereas now, I think guests want to know, so you see the sticker on a room, that, like, like we have at Viceroy Hotels everywhere, when a housekeeper finishes sanitizing a room, it gets physically sealed and the guest breaks the seal when they're entering that room and it makes them feel confident that they're walking into a room that has been prepared solely for them. I think some of that stuff will still, will still remain. Um, air purification. Um, I have here beside me on the floor um, a unit from a company called Molecule, and it's an air filtration unit. It, it looks like something that Apple made. It's super cool. N1H1 eradication, protection against coronavirus, er eradicates pollen. Um, we would normally have had a unit like that hidden behind a desk doing what it does. Now it's out front because we're right. saying to our guests, we've made an investment, we've made we made an effort, if you recall, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, companies who, who manufactured cleaning products, who had spent decades trying to remove the scent of those cleaning products, were deliberately putting it back in. So the guests would walk into a public space, and it's like that moment that you walk into a public swimming pool and you smell the chlorine, you go, oh, it's chlorine in the pool, so it's, it's clean. I don't think we're gonna get away from that anytime soon. I, I think there's going to be what is right now a very active, conscious desire for guests to, to be, uh, feeling confident that we've done what we need to do to keep our spaces clean and, and sanitized for them. Right. That will become less of a subconscious thing, but I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Now, interesting, except for that last one that you just mentioned, all the other topics that we've been talking about are things that were already probably going to happen prior to COVID. So outside cleaning, I want to make sure that everybody knows that all of these things was where we were going to wind up anyway. I'm hoping that this particular crisis gets us there quicker. And it sounds to me, Bill, that it's doing that for you and your company. But when we're talking about technology, how do you think you're going to be able to leverage it going forward to maybe, to combine it with the employment issue, lower your dependence on a certain number of employees, perhaps for back of house tasks that aren't going to interfere with guest experience and help keep those people up front facing and interacting with guests instead? You know, I think I think the guest is going to ultimately drive us in the direction that that they want us to go, and and I think we've we've seen a lot of um, change over the past year, and we've heard a lot of talk that the new luxury has gone from being high touch, which was the very nature of luxury, to low touch, or indeed some were arguing that the new luxury is a no touch environment. I don't think that's going to 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 remain a at the heart of what we do. There has always been one human being through their actions, making another human being happy. That's why we do what we do. That's what hospitality is. That's what the hotel business is. Um, and I don't think that that is ever going to change. Um, and, and the technologies that we introduce, the processes that we've introduced um, are important. Some will survive. Um, but human beings want to interact with other human beings. They want that face-to-face -face contact. We want to see a smile on, on another human being's face. We want through our actions to put that smile on that other human being's face. And, you know, I think it would be a very, very sad day if that comes second to automation and, and technology. But automation and technology can help you reduce expenses. For sure. The way of the guest, right? Behind the scenes, so to speak, the back of house kind of world. Have you thought about how you might be able to leverage technology to reduce yourself on the dependency well, of the total number of employees, but not the guest facing one? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, that, that's not something that has anything to do with the pandemic. We were doing right, that. Absolutely. And, yeah, we were doing that, that in any case. And it's about um, having smart partnerships in place. And there are people out there who are developing technology. So let, let's maybe track the guest journey from what I talked about with, with voice activation in a room, a, a guest in a room can speak to the Amazon device or the Google device and say, uh, I, I need two more bath towels. That, that gets interpreted through a, an AI process um, whereby it's recognized that the guest needs bath towels. Mm -hmm. um, that then interacts with a, with a program uh, called Alice, which is a, a back of house technology that allows us to deliver outstanding service very efficiently 
to our guests. Alice then identifies which of our housekeepers is in closest physical proximity to the room, sends a message to the Samsung smartwatch that's on their wrist, which says room 411 has requested two bath towels, and they grab them from the cupboard, they knock on the door. Now, I, I'd like to think, and it's, I'm, I'm Irish, so we exaggerate a little bit, that by the time the guest has said the word towels, to the Alexa device, there's a knock on the door and someone's saying, yes, for towels? It doesn't happen quite that quickly, but it's actually not far off it. And those technologies exist today, they're in place today, um, and, and that should be the practice for everybody going forward. So, so Gunn, unless you have a question, I have another question a little off topic. Yeah, go for it, dude. Viceway has done a great job in building a brand, obviously. Um, in this these times, and you've seen a lot of mergers and a lot of changes, I mean, where is Viceroy as far as, you know, how many hotels you have now? Uh, 15 open and operating and uh, six in our pipeline. Are you getting knocks on the door from these big players? Um, well, I, l let me answer that in a couple of ways. First and foremost, um, our development folks are super busy at the moment because one of the things that has happened through pandemic is that I think the relationship between management companies and owners has been tested like never before. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was watching recently uh, the, the show you guys did with, uh, with John Bortz and Jen um, at, uh, at Pebblebrook, who, who are a, a proud partner of ours. And, and we're, you know, we, we run a number of hotels for them. Um, and, and I think management companies that were collaborative by nature um, will actually come out of pandemic doing very well because we have strong relationships in place with our owners. Those owners are our best ambassadors. Um, and that's not the case for every management company. So our phones are very active at the moment with people saying um, either we've, we've acquired a distressed asset as a result of pandemic or we're making a change uh, and, and we're evaluating a lot of, of management um, opportunities at the moment. So there will be growth for us in the very near term. Um, we're, we're independent. We're one of the smaller independents. That said, we have very, very um, good reach through our participation in the Global Hotel Alliance. So there are more than 30 individual independent and proudly independent brands across the world who are members of GHA. We, we share a loyalty program called Discovery that has 16 million members that are active around the world. So yeah, we're a smaller company. We, we, we have a, <clears throat> a relatively small portfolio of hotels, but we have access to scale and size in order to do the things that other small companies might not be able to do, such as have a meaningful loyalty program in place, to have collaborations and partnerships with the major travel companies and airlines. So, um, you know, it's a good time to be small. Speed to market is everything. We have uh, rapid decision making. We can pivot according to circumstances very quickly, and we can typically do that much faster and more efficiently than the big brands. So I, I think we're exactly in the right place at the right time. And be sure to check out our show from February 24th, where we talked to Christopher Hartley, the CEO of the Global Hotel Alliance. He was uh, reaching out to us from uh, Dubai. It was a really great show. Goes into detail about how all these brands kind of coming together to help compete against the big folks that are, uh, are out there. Um, Bill, really cool. I got to tell you, when you said 15 hotels, I was taken aback because – You've done what I think W Hotels has done. Didn't have a, a huge portfolio of properties, but have created a name that makes it appear as if you have dozens and dozens and dozens of hotels around the world. So congratulations on your great PR efforts out there because I think people believe you to have many more properties uh, than you do. Hopefully you'll get to even bigger numbers soon. Yeah, and and, and I think you put, you know, thank you for, for what you've said first and foremost. And, and, and I will... I'll take the compliment, but I'll take it on behalf of a team of extremely yeah. talented and dedicated people who, who run a number of different functions here. Because the way that you build and maintain the perception of a brand is, is all about how it's activated and how it's communicated. And, and that is about adhering to the parameters of the brand. But it's also in these days about how we manage and maintain our, our presence on social media, um, how we interact with people through our website, uh, the digital marketing um, that we do. And it's it's about, you know, again, we're a small company. We don't spend the kind of dollars that the big the big brands do. Um, so it's about spending those dollars wisely and, and putting the brand in front of people in a channel and at a time when they will be most uh, receptive to it. But above all, it's about loving what your brand is. And it's about living the brand and loving the brand. And, and, and here at Viceroy, we're a very small team of people, but we're 
madly passionate about our company. We adore what we do. We have a very activated ideology. We care deeply about the purpose of hospitality. Um, and I hope that that shows. We wear our hearts in our sleeves and we're proud of it. Uh, I, I think when you run a hotel company, that's a good place to wear it. And um, one of the questions I, I ask guests from time to time, as we come out of the pandemic and people are getting vaccinated, we have a, um, a good or a bad way of just forgetting things. And we move on with our lives. And I don't think anybody's going to forget this time anytime soon, but we do get back to normal relatively quickly. Outside of your team, outside of everybody pulling together and, you know, the feeling of your team doing what they're supposed to do. On a personal note, what's the one moment that changed you during the pandemic? I think it was the realization um, of the phrase that I mentioned at the outset at the top of the show, which was control what you can control and, and just react to the circumstances that you cannot control. And I tried to control everything. Um, I, I, I was very personally affected by letting colleagues go from employment. It hurt. It, it, it hurt a lot. And, and I was very frustrated that I couldn't change those, those circumstances personally. And it was driving me pretty crazy. Um, and I came to the realization that the best that I could do for, for the team that I'm privileged to lead was to manage the circumstances to the best of my ability to communicate and to increase the frequency of communication. Right. Um, what was the, the moment you came to that transparency. What was the moment um, you came to that realization? When was, what was the breaking point or someone tapped you on the shoulder that, that you depend on for mentorship? What was the moment that you said, okay, I got to change my thinking? I think it was, it, it, it was when I realized that this is probably <clears throat> the, the 10th, 12th, 15th day in a row that I was staring at the ceiling at three o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how to end the pandemic. And, and I said <laughs> to myself, you can't. And if you keep doing this, you'll be no good to anybody. Your team right. needs you to be positive, optimistic, and energetic, um, and and get sleep, you know, and 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 be be the person that they need you to be. Um, and, and I went to sleep at that moment, and I woke up calmer than I had been in a number of months. And then I also thought, you know, I'm I'm having to deal with a change in circumstance as somebody who who has typically travelled anywhere between 185 and 210 days a year. For the last 10, 10 years, in 2020, I traveled for 12 days. Uh, and I said, so where is the opportunity in that? And, and like many people, you know, I did some work at home. Um, I, I put some fitness equipment into my house. I put a, an endless pool in my backyard. So twice a day now, I, I start and end my day swimming against a, yeah. a manufactured wow. current. One of those. Um, and I'm feeling healthier than I have for, for 20 years. So um, I, I think I was get, I was starting to feel unhealthy. I was starting to feel um anxious and i think one of the things anthony that i know you and i have talked about in the past is the focus that we've had in hospitality on physical health um, and and the absolute lack of focus and lack of awareness and lack of conversation about mental health and i think the mental health toll on hospitality on hotel colleagues has been immense we need to talk about it we need to make it okay for people to ask for help and to put up their hand to to talk about issues to talk about stresses I was incredibly stressed at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it was affecting my health, both physical and mental. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to be able to, to rectify that. Not everybody had the ability to do so. And, and, and I would just urge people who are listening and watching this show, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to admit that. It's okay to ask. And the, the greatest demonstration of strength in a human being is to have the courage to ask another human being for help. And I would urge people to do that. Don't bottle it up. Don't keep it inside. We're stronger together than we are individually. Beautiful. And, um, and while you're thinking about your mental health, go check, go to novacantinews.com. Check our show on December 1st, where we talk to Dr. Aaron Berman from the National Institute of Mental Health on how to get past some of the mental issues that we're, we're dealing with, including some of this PTSD stuff that we're probably going to do. And Glenn, I'm delighted that you did that. And, and there are experts out there who, who can help us. We're at that time of the year as a company where we're doing performance dialogues with everybody. Um, and, and it used to be like a like many brands, a 15-page check-the-box kind of process. And now it's a, it's a one-page thing. It is a dialogue. It's a conversation. Um, and the first question that we ask that, that goes out on the piece of now automated piece of paper that a colleague fills in and, and that we then talk about is quite simply, 
how are you feeling? Um, and for most of the performance dialogues that, that we have had, that question leads to a dialogue that probably takes up more than 50% of the time allocated to the dialogue. And by the way, don't allocate time. Let it go for as long as it needs to go. But, you know, we, 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 can, we can all ask the programmed questions. What do you think you could do better? Where do you want to be five years from now? And you know what? They're probably important questions. If the only question that you ask somebody that you work with these days is how are you feeling and is there anything that I can do to help you feel better, then you've done a good thing. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. interesting. I'm sorry, go ahead. So you said, what do you do then when somebody says, I'm fine, I'm fine? Well, the first thing you do is, is you realize that that is an, an amber alert um, because as you guys know, oh, you've started me off on something now, Glenn. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I, I think the, the, the ultimate profanity in hospitality is the F word. And it is that word, it's fine. And we should never accept the word fine in any circumstance. So it, it, if it's like when a guest checks out of a hotel and they're checking out after a five night stay, they're paying their bill and we say, how was your stay? And they it say, was it was fine. I mean, no, that's tragic. That, that should never be accepted. And we should apply the same thinking and same logic to interacting with human beings. And that's, um, a, that's a good point. And Glenn, that was a great question because this is where I have a problem with putting managers in positions they don't belong. Because when you're a young manager and you're having that performance dialogue, which I love the name of that, you're having the performance dialogue and you say, how are you doing? And they say, fine. That manager really needs to understand. Because if you say it to me, right, I am going to say I'm fine. Yeah. If you're, if you're, well, if you're, if you're asking me, I'm going to say I'm fine because that's why. Anthony, you, you are. If that's but the what question. I'm saying, what but, I'm saying is, but I'm not fine. Just like nobody's fine. No. I, I, I need someone to penetrate and like be 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 experienced enough and have key words like you said amber alert have yeah. key words to get me out of my shell because if you're talented or even if you have those key words you can get even me a guy's been doing so long time to walk into a room say how are you doing and i say fine and in three minutes you may have me in tears if you ask me the right question right and that and that that's the point a predictable question will always elicit a predictable answer and if you say to somebody how are you probability is they're going to say, I'm fine. Um, if, you, if you change, and I do this when, when, when speaking publicly, and this is the moment that the audience start to shift uncomfortably in their seats, and I say to them, here's a, here's a dare, here's a challenge for you when you leave this talk. The next time you, you're about to say to somebody, how are you, insert a word into the question and instead say, how proud are you? Now, the first thing that's going to happen is someone's going to go, what? And you can say, no, I'm, I'm, or how proud are you? Or, or how happy are you? Or how confident are you? Not how are you, put another word in there. And it's going to make people think, and then you lead to a conversation. But if you keep walking around as a leader saying, how are you? How are you? How are you? People are going to go, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And, and life doesn't change. Life doesn't improve. And somebody just put a comment up that I saw flash up. Okay, ask ask open-ended questions. It's genius. Yep. Yeah, I love that. Uh, excellent. So... I think it's really a really good point is that we all need to figure out better ways to take care of each other and really get to the bottom of what's going on. That will help improve, um, in my guess, the experience of the guests as well. Because when you have great, happy staff, they're going to take care of the the, the, the customers. Um, Michael Weinberg says, you have an awesome way of honing in on and sharing the most important messages and getting the most important answers. Great advice to dealing with our team members. That's um. That's great. You're getting a lot of nice, positive feedback here. But what kind of advice would you get give to people? Maybe younger people that are just starting out. On our show, Bill, we're talking a bit, lot about how this is the perfect time to enter the hospitality business. You probably get a lot further ahead than you would have 10 years ago at the same age. So what advice would you give to them? What are you thinking about when it comes to your younger colleagues in there as opposed to older folks like us? So first and foremost, what, what I would say is um, – you know, listen to your mothers. And what I mean by that is remember the advice that all of our mothers gave us, which is to say please and thank you. And, and never forget that. And as a leader, it's the most important thing you can do. I'm starting to travel again now that I'm vaccinated. And, and tomorrow, I'm going to Viceroy Los Cabos uh, to visit with Peter Bowling and the entire team there. And I'm going to say thank you. And I am going to travel. Uh, and, and Mike Walsh, no relation, just similar surname. Mike Walsh, our COO. Between us, we're going to travel to every Viceroy location in the next 45 days to say thank you. And, awesome. and, and that's the most important thing. For young people coming into the industry, this might be a little bit of an unexpected answer. I would say join the industry, it's an amazing industry. Um, 
change the industry, come in with that courage of youth and make us, make us as leaders, think about where we need to be focused. Because here's what's going to happen in, in hotel companies around the world. We're all going to predictably focus entirely on getting back to profitability. And, and anybody who has a theme for a year is going to, you know, get, get, as I said earlier, get the cash registers ringing, bring the revenues, drive the profits. Um, and, and that's not where I think our focus needs to be. We at Viceroy are hugely proud that we've launched internally in January a theme for 2021. And that theme is Viceroy for everyone. And that theme recognizes that I, as a leader, have been deficient in my responsibility to make sure that this company is as focused on diversity, inclusion, tolerance, and inclusivity as we need to be. And, and we are on a mission to change that. Think of 2020. The pandemic wasn't the only profound thing that happened on the globe. There was incredible social movement. And, and there are people who are very correctly saying, we will not be ignored anymore. We want to be respected. We want to be celebrated, irrespective of, of the race, of the color of our skin, of the religion that we follow and how we self-identify. So I would say to young people coming into the industry, enter the industry to make it better. Let's set out together to make sure that hospitality is the beacon of tolerance, of diversity and of, of, of inclusiveness yeah, and for all. That's beautifully said. And one of the things that I talk about in my book is that you have to stand up for yourself. There's certain instances in my uh, life, in my career, where I was um, taken advantage of where I worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week. That's not being disrespected. That's just somebody seeing a talented person that really, really wants to work hard. And I did it, and I did it willingly. But then there's a few times in my career, four or five times, where I was disrespected. And each time I held my ground. And each time I put my career on the line. And I really want young people to understand the difference. You know, I just spoke to my, to, to uh, I'll say a friend of mine, um, and I don't want to say my daughter because she'll yell at me. But, um, and, and, and I had the same conversation. And and it's really important to know the difference. If someone's giving you an opportunity to work really hard, really long hours, and giving you a lot of responsibility, they see something in you. If someone <laughs> is taking your spirit, if someone is not treating you well and is disrespecting you, that is not okay. And I think growing up when we were coming up in this industry, and I speak to Glenn and his industry and Bill Yu, is I would imagine there are times where you really wanted to speak up and either you did or you didn't. And I think today I try to make an environment where young people should be able to speak freely as long as it's respectfully if somebody is doing something that they don't like. And I think I that, that unfortunately was a big problem with me growing up in this industry. And look, I... I, I... I agree, and I think we've all we've all been there, and we've all seen the kind of the cliche of the screaming chef, and 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 that behaviors that should no longer be tolerated. But I think that the the, the young people coming into the workplace today um, are more confident; they won't tolerate that. And in terms of of managing your brand as an employer of choice, these folks also have the immediacy of access to social media. So if they get disrespected in the, in the workplace, they're going to tell everyone about it and, and your employer brand is going to get correctly um, shredded in an instant. And, you know, my my son Lucas is, I, I, I think, in, um, in Dublin listening to this and watching this as we're live. So hi, Lucas. He's in Trinity College in Dublin studying global business and will soon be be starting um, his, his career. Um, and I think everything you've said, uh, Anthony is correct. So Lucas, listen to Uncle Anthony. Do, do what he said. <laughs> you know, but you 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 get respect by giving respect. The other thing I'd say to to young people coming in is also have some patience. Um, don't start a job, and a month later be in the personnel office giving out that you're not a senior vice president yet. Don't change employer every six months so that your resume looks like a game of hopscotch. Right, right. right. Um, and and that is happening out there. I I think that. I, I look for people who have the correct balance of ambition and a sense of urgency to advance their career because that's what you want to see, but a little bit of patience and a little bit of the, the recognition that you have to work toward that next step and that takes some time and that we as employers will give loyalty, but we want to get loyalty at the same time. Don't leave after six months because somebody else has offered you a buck an hour extra. And don't annoy me every five seconds. I, I'm like, you're really talented. I brought you on a team because you're really talented. 
don't annoy me. Go do your job. I'm going to take care of you. You're going to take care of me. And if I don't leave. And there are so many times where I've, I've brought on really strong young people. And every 30 seconds, they're like, and what's next? And what's next? It's like, what's next is get really good at what you do. Yeah. And I'm going to take care of you. I take care of people. And that's what I'll do. I'll come to you before you ask for a raise. I'll come to you before you ask for promotion. I'll come to you about that new hotel we're opening and yeah. say, hey, do you want to get involved in it? You know that. So just do your job and I will tap you on the shoulder. And that's, and, 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 and so I want aggressive people. I want people to be able to speak up. But when people are just like you said, impatient, and believe it or not, I'm a pretty patient person until I'm not. But I, in my career, I've been very, I've been very patient until I wasn't. And then when I wasn't, I couldn't sleep. I just had to go do something bigger or better or more challenging. And but I, I let them squeeze the sponge until all the water came out, and then I made a decision whether it's time for me to get promoted, and they helped me get promoted, or I left. But you're yeah. right, being impatient in this business is not a good idea. And I think if you can if you can match patience with flexibility and that that curiosity that that desire for exploration, sure. Being in a hotel company is the best place to be because you do get those phone calls where where someone says, "Hey, guess what? We're opening, like us, we're we're opening in in the next month um, our first uh, hotel in in Europe, and we're opening a ski and ski out resort um, in an extraordinary destination called Kapaunik in Serbia. That's creating opportunities for people within the company to travel to a destination either as task force or as permanent employees to experience new cultures. Um, and, and to, you know, one of the things that we can do better than any other industry in travel, tourism and hospitality is we can overcome prejudice because prejudice is driven by ignorance. And the way you overcome ignorance is by experiencing other people's cultures, other people's beliefs and immersing yourself in their world. And, and if young people coming into our industry come in with that desire for exploration, that curiosity and that willingness to explore, to travel and to, to try new things, then happy days. Yeah, and that's why, again, I've said it before in the show, why everybody should be forced to commute for a year on a New York City subway. Because you can see all those incredible cultures that are all around you and realize, hey, we're all just the same, trying to trying to make it work over here. Uh, Colleen says, um, but but that's Gordon's purpose of his show, yelling. I think that's why they gave him Master Chef, so you can see the compassionate side of him. So uh, during Hell's Kitchen, he doesn't have to yell as, uh, as much. Any final thoughts, um, Bill, before we wrap up the today? We're already past the uh, hour. That went super, super fast. It, it did. And, and look, thank you. First and foremost, my, my, my thought is to, to each and every um, industry colleague that, that is out there listening uh, or not, um, again, thank you, particularly to my colleagues across Viceroy. I have missed each and every one of you terribly. Um, I think technologies such as this are great to keep us connected. I, I do not want to live in a Zoom world. I want to come out um, and, and at the, at the first instance to stand socially distant from each, each of my colleagues in every Viceroy location and say thank you, maybe a fist bump. I can't wait till we can get back to being what, as I said during the, the, the show, I genuinely think is at the heart of what we do is being human beings, making other human beings happy. Um, and, and everything that we do should speak to that. So thank you to all of my Viceroy colleagues. Thank you to all of the industry colleagues. Welcome back to those colleagues who are back in employment for leaders that are out there. Not everybody is back. And yeah, we can worry about the difficulty recruiting in certain destinations. There are still colleagues of ours who are, are excluded from employment, who want to work, who want to come back. And our job is to get them back and to keep them back. Um, and you know, ask for help. Keep the dialogue going. A performance dialogue should not be a once a year conversation. It's it's a it's an every conversation. And don't accept ever um, an answer that somebody is just fine. Now, now Bill, you got to give yourself a good shameless plug here. Tell us a little bit about this amazing property, for example, in St. Lucia, right behind me. I mean, Sugar Beach and St. Lucia, Mark yeah. Sterner and 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 um, and the entire team there. I mean, they exemplify. Uh, what we what we do, Viceroy is a contradiction. We we live in this point of collision, as an oxymoron, uh, of consistent individuality and its consistency colliding with individuality, which is where special hospitality experiences, unique hospitality experiences, live. And uh, and there is none that personify that better um, than than Sugar Beach, um, beautifully situated in between two dormant um, uh, piton, two dormant volcanoes, although there's been a little volcanic action in the Caribbean um, over the past few days that, that has uh, been on a neighboring island, yes. um, and, and beautiful white, white beaches. Um, they, they've remained open for the vast majority of the pandemic and have become a sanctuary 
um, for for so many people to to travel to. So um, I think I think Mike and I might have to arm wrestle over which one of us gets to go to St. Lucia first to say thank you to the colleagues there. <laughs> Maybe you should go together on, on that one, right? There you go. But yeah, and, and look, I, I, again, it's about having purpose. And, and thank you guys again for the, the show that you did from Hotel Zena, this amazing hotel that, that has been created in Washington, D.C., that celebrates the courage and the contribution um, of, of incredible women. I'll, I'll tell you, to I respect. I'm sorry, sorry Bill. I didn't mean to cut you off, but out of all the shows that we've done, um, that's the show that people say, what was that hotel in Washington? I want to go see it. People mention that hotel a lot. Yeah, so, I mean, to, to, to have the ability to use hospitality as a platform to share such a positive um, message, and then, you know, irrespective of where we are, to my colleagues here in, in Los Angeles, at, at L'Hermitage, at Delphina, at Viceroy, Santa Monica, to the amazing team, in our four hotels in, in San Francisco, who are going to be up against it for a little bit for reasons we talked about earlier in, in terms of business climate, but are just so positive and so uh, resilient. You know, Mexico uh, in Riviera Maya and, and Los Cabos, um, the folks in Snowmass, everybody that I've, I've mentioned. Um, I, I, I Look, I love what I do. I wake up every morning thinking I'm the luckiest man alive to be surrounded by the people that I work with, to have the product um, that the ownership groups who hire us to manage their products um, have given us. And, um, you know, every day at the moment is, is better than the day before in terms of the recovery, in terms of seeing what's happening as we come out of pandemic. Um, you know, just let's just get everybody vaccinated and, and get back to, to whatever that new normal will look like and celebrate it. Excellent. And I want everyone to check out the show from November 10th when we are on location at Hotel Xena. Very special show. Go check that out November 10th. You can find that at NoVacancyNews.com or on uh, the No Vacancy page on YouTube. Bill, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you. Thank you, guys. We got to get you. you Bill. I'll see you soon. I think, we're, I think uh, Anthony and I have such severe man crushes on you. that we're yeah, not I, I, I just want to be able to speak the way you speak. Oh, please. I'm, I'm actually, I, I'm the Remington Steel of the company. I'm an actor that gets brought in to do these things. I have no idea about the hospitality business. I've never worked in it. Before. Well, hopefully uh, one day they promote to 007. There you go. Hey, Anthony. Dude, you I, took Anthony. the words out of my mouth. He's really 007. You took the Anthony, words out of my I, mouth. I have a question. I have a quick question for you. Um, how, how far away are we from, from um, conventions taking place again? When am I going to be able to sit um, quietly and frustrated in the back row of a convention, watching you speak, wishing I could do do it like you do it. When, um, when, probably, when, when in probably in May. Probably in May. Okay. Right. May 10th through 12th, Hunter Hotels Investment Conference. We're going to be over there, Bill. Looking forward to uh, broadcasting live yeah. from there. I'm hosting a panel there. Can't wait to get back on the road. As you said, we don't want to live in this uh, online media world, except, of course, for all of you guys out there. Be sure to check us out every day at 12 o'clock. Bill, thanks again for being here. We'll see you again really soon. Take care, guys. Stay right. safe. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye. Incredible, inspirational, and I love that guy. Man, that's why he runs a great company. All right, my brother, take us out. All right, everybody, be sure buy the adapters. Sean Worker and I worked really hard on this. Go there, theadapters.net. Buy this book. All right, everybody, you've got one life. So remember, blaze on, and I want you to do a better job selling your book. Take care of yourself. Well. But you seem very rushed to get us to the end of the. No, I'm not rushed. I just like the, 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 the adapters every day. You rush yourself off the adapters. I don't know what the hell. Like, I'm, uh, I don't know what my problem is. We'll focus on that more starting uh, tomorrow. We got the official press. Be kind conference to yourself. Speak and all that stuff. All right. You be kind to yourself. You be kind to yourself. You be kind to yourself. <laughs>